All right, Booker Tov. Today's daf officially is Samachay 65. We're almost at the bottom of Samachay Lamad Aleph. We pick up with the two dots, Admatahu Pochet, which is five lines from the bottom. We were dealing with a very important sugi the other day about when the marriage is in trouble and one of the partners focusing on the wife is not doing his or her responsibilities um, and using various means to try to uh, either get the compliance and whether we work with that long term or we just try to move straight to the get, what we do in the interim um, and so on. And as we also mentioned, the important issues, two important issues that came out, one was A, does the husband really have an, have an obligation to go find work. He has an obligation to pay the bills, but the Ana Eflach, can he be forced to go ahead and find work? And uh, more significantly for the, for the Aguna issues is about when the woman basically says the marriage is intolerable, it's one thing to say we're, we move straight to a get or she immediately loses her ksuva or so on, but how much do we compel the husband to give a get? And in a similar discussion towards the end, was compelling the husband or Tosa discusses whatever, you know, tricking the husband or whatever to do a chalitza if he's refusing to move on a situation. We now pick up at the bottom of Samasal al with the issue about the penalties, the financial penalties, and why they are different for the man and the woman. So to remind you, the Mishnah said that for the woman, we reduce the ksuva by seven dinarim um, on a weekly basis. Um, and uh, by the man, we it, we increase the ksuva. If he's not living on, up to his responsibilities, the values increase for the benefit of the woman by three. And the other opinion was seven and three, not dinarim, but this uh, but this thing called tarpi'ikin. So the Gemara is going to discuss what tarpi'ikin are. But the first thing you need to know is, is that a dinar equals a zuz. Okay? And a zuz, I was going to print out a whole chunk, but I accidentally left it at home. But four zuz, equals a cella, okay, or a, um, or a, uh, it, it equals a biblical shekel, let me forget that, okay, a shekel of the Torah. So, when the Torah says that there's 50 shekel for the, uh, for the bride price, for the mohar, it's 200 zuz, okay, so there's, the, so that's just, that's the only reason I put that up, so you understand where we get 200 zuz. But if you, it, it's, a dinar is a zuz, so basically the ksuva is 200 zuz, and if we reduce it by seven zoos a week, that's going to last about how long? Do we want to do the math? Seven divided by 200? About 25 weeks, right? About, no, more, 28 weeks or something. Okay, right? Mm -hmm. Seven, two, 14, 60, um, right. 28, eight, 28, 28 <laughs> weeks. Okay? And if we do, if we do three zoos a week, then it'll last. This is only the base amount if there's Tosephus or whatever. But anyway, if we do three zoos a week, that's six, 18, 20, about 67 weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. That's the first opinion about. Excuse me, Ugh, I did that wrong. The three zoos a week is how much we increase it for the husband. Okay, so if we decrease it, if we're only starting with the base ksuva of two hundred, and we decrease it by seven zoos a week, it'll it'll go to zero in twenty eight weeks. There might be a lot more in terms of the tosefet and the dowry that she brings in, and so on. But that's till you get to the. That's how long it'll take to run out the two hundred. So let's take a look at the gemara. The gemara says like this. But the other opinions were not seven zoos, but seven tarpiikin. So my tarpiikin. What's tarpiikin? I'm Rav Sheshes Astira. An astira, okay. The kama astira. How much is this astira? Pal gadzuz, a half a zuz. Tanya nami yachi. Reb Yudol mer shlosha tarpiikin shehem tisha ma'in. So it's three tarpiikin, which are three ma'a, um, and which are nine ma'a. Excuse me. Okay. Tisha ma'in ma'a v'chitzi l'kol yom. So it's a ma'a and a half each day if if you ignore a Shabbos. Okay. So we'll ignore the ma'a part a minute. More significant for us is that if he says it is seven zuz and a zuz, it, it says seven tarpiikin and a tarpiikin is a half a zuz, that's three and a half zuz a week, right? Am I getting this right? Mm -hmm. Okay, three and a half zuz a week. So that'll last twice as long. That'll last 56 weeks, according to him. Okay, so that's what he says. So the question is, do you reduce it by seven zoos a week or by seven half zoos a week? Um, and that's to get to the bottom of the 200, the base amount. But as I said, there's to seven, Nidunian, whatever. Now he says that that equals um, um, three and a half zoos equals, uh, three tarp ekin, excuse me. Um, I am so sorry, people, you're not staffing me. I don't know what the heck is wrong with me. Okay. A tarp ekin is, he says, he's, no, am I getting it right? Shlosha tarpi'ikin. 
Now, why does he say tarpeikin? In the Mishnah, he says Shiva tarpeikin. Oh, because here he's saying three for what we increase it for the husband. I don't know why I'm making it so difficult. Seven tarpeikin is three and a half. I was right the first time. Okay. That's for her, okay? When he says here three tarpeikin, that's how much we increase it when he's not doing his responsibility. So when he's not doing his responsibility, we increase, increase it for three zuz according to the Chachamim, and for three tarpeikin according to Abuda. That's how much we increase it, which is nine ma'in, which is a ma'an and a half each day. So now we're going to deal with the difference between the three and the seven, and also why we did six days of the week and not seven days of the week. So let's take a look. I'm only Rabbi Chia bar Yosef Lishmuel. Ma'ishna ihu, why is it true by him, the Avin and Le, the Shah? that we give him, right, because the Gemara understands logically that if, forget now the whole Tarpeikin versus Zuz, which I think I succeeded in confusing everybody. Let's forget that. The basic difference is that whatever the coinage is, for him, it, for when she's not doing her responsibility, it's seven that we reduce it. When he's not doing his responsibility, we increase it by three. So there's two implicit logics here. Number one is, is that if we look at the days of the week, every day she's not doing her responsibility, we decrease it and decrease it by one, either one zuz or one tarpi. But we re decrease the ksuva by one, you know, for every day she's not doing her responsibility. For every day he's not doing his responsibility, we increase it only by a half. Right? That you get that seventh, mm -hmm. and we don't we don't count Shabbos for him not doing his responsibility. So there's two questions here. Why is he being fined one when he's being fined a half? Okay, and why is she being fined for Shabbos when he's not being fined for Shabbos? That's the key question. Forget the tarpeik thing that was just confusing. Whether it's zuz or tarpeik, the difference is one versus a half, and whether you do it for Shabbos or not. So my shna, where are we? Um, ihu di avin and lay to Shabbos. Why, when she's not doing her responsibility, does he get for Shabbos? Meaning she gets fined for Shabbos, which benefits him. Umay shna ihi, when it's he that is the injured party, di lo yavin and lay to Shabbos. She doesn't get for Shabbos. So the Gemara says, ihu di mifchas kapachis lo machzikas chas Shabbos. Because when she, when he's, when she's doing the wrong thing and we're reducing the ksuva, to reduce the debt doesn't look like you're getting paid for something on Shabbos. If the debt, he's benefiting from it, from the fact that the day of Shabbos is being deducted, that extra, that, that extra zuz, but it doesn't look like he's being paid for anything on Shabbos. It's just that the debt is being reduced. Ihu, the Osufi Kamosfi, when he's not doing his responsibility and we're fining him, so if we were to fine him for Shabbos, Merci Kishar Shabbos. Then the fact that on Shabbos, she is a sense earning a half of, you know, she's earning a half of a zuz off of him, right? If he was being paying a half a zuz a day, including Shabbos, if we were increasing the debt when he's not doing his responsibility, then she's effectively earning money on Shabbos. That's, that's the concern. Do you, do you get that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now the Gemara says, now what's the difference between a whole and a half? I'm going to read here by Rav Yosef Lishmur, Ma bein morid le moredes. Why is there a difference between a morid and a moredes? That for her, for her, she gets fined one zuz a day, including Shabbos, as we've said. For him, he gets fined only a half zuz a day and not including Shabbos. So the Gemara says, Amar lei, tzei lumad mishuk shel zonot. Go see from the uh, marketplace of the prostitutes. Mi um, socheres mi. Who hires out who? The men, right, the, 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 there's a much bigger market for female prostitutes than for male prostitutes. Okay, so the men are are hiring the women. And therefore, what does that prove? So Rashi says, therefore, assuming that we're dealing that Morid and Moredes is about withholding sex, he's seen to be the much more injured party, that men are seen here as ones having much greater sexual desire, and therefore, they're the ones that are being much more injured if, in a case where one of the parties is withholding sex. Davar Acher, Zegi Tromi Bachu, the other issue is that this one's genitals is on the outside and the other is on the inside. What does that mean? Either you could say it's symbolic of the fact of who has a greater sex drive in the eyes of the Gemara, or as Rashi says, if the husband might, you know, it will be, if he's having an erection and he's not getting sexual satisfaction, it's more obvious to people than if the woman is not. So somehow he is seen here as the more injured party. Interestingly, although he has a mitzvah of Ona, he is seen as the more injured party when sex is being withheld. And therefore, his, she, she is fined double when she is the one that's withholding sex than what he is fined. 
fined. Okay, so two differences. She's fi- he's she's fined double, <laughs> one per day, him only a half per day, and she's fined on Shabbos because it doesn't look like anybody's earning money because the debt is being reduced. Whereas he's not fined on Shabbos because that then does look like he's earning money um, on Shabbos, as it were. Yes. They're concerned about Shabbat wages, but they're not concerned about Yom Kippur. Um, that's a good question. I know what to say. Tells us anyway raises the issue that why don't we just have half law? It's not Nikar, the se- you know, we're not treating Shabbos separately. Anyway, whatever it is, bottom line, again, you have once again this sort of, you know, disparity, um, imbalance between the uh, man and the woman in the amount that it's being fined. Also, you know, to add to the fact, of course, that the man can always do the divorce, you know, initiate a divorce, which the woman cannot, as we discussed yesterday. Um, and um, the question is about how quickly is the ksuva being reduced from the 200 based on whether it's seven zoos or seven tarpeik, which are seven half zoos. We're talking about between a half year to a year if you were to go through the process in the Mishnah, let alone if there was a ksu, if there was a tosefis and an adunia and so on. In the Gemara, of course, we saw versions that it was a much faster process. We didn't want to slip it out. We wanted to move much more quickly to the get. Yes. What about all these codices? They're all different from different times and different places? Some of them oh, are, yeah. I had meant to actually print are. out. There's a very nice, uh, if you go on um, on the web, on I think uh, Hebrew Wikipedia, they have a very nice discussion of all the different oh, currencies and whatever. I printed out a chart, but then, of course, I left it at home. Yes. <laughs> well, also, the value of the coins changed in part because of inflation, inflation, inflation right. in part because of deliberate attempts to debase the coinage. Aha. Okay, moving on. Uh, that, that, that's when you pay for, for services done on Shabbos, but you don't single out Shabbos. It's part of a payment for the rest of the week as well. Okay, let's move on. We're going we're gonna to catch up today. Next Mishnah. Okay, so we sort of are jumping back and forth. It's like a chiastic structure because first, if you remember, we did a Mishnah that said, what are the woman's domestic responsibilities? Then we said, we spoke about his obligation of Ona. Then we spoke about Morid and Moredes, where the Gemara in the last line clearly made the assumption, although it was debated, that we're, that we're talking primarily about the issue about not having sex. So we did Mazo, we did we did Malacha, sex, sex, right? Obligations of Ona, not having Ona. And now we're dealing with ways of back to the issue about Malacha and Mizonos. So let's take a look. And this is the counterpart of Mizonos, his obligations to provide for her. So Hamashres Ishto Ayudei Shalich. Somebody is basically providing for his wife through a intermediary. They are not sharing actual domicile. If they're sharing domicile, then mostly this is a moot point. They just have their meals together. But for whatever reason, maybe he's away on a business trip. Maybe they're working things out. Who knows what the re- reasons are? He is not living in his house, okay? And he is having somebody basically pay her food bills and provide for her. So what, therefore, is his minimum obligations to her? Lo yifchas la mishne kavim chitim. He cannot pay any less than, give her less than four kav, which is some type of a value measurement of, of uh of wheat, or may arba kavim saorim, or four kav of barley, if she prefers, presumably if she, she gets to, cho- to choose, if she prefers barley to wheat. Um, presum- barley was seen as obviously as not as ideal of a, uh, a you know, a grain. Amma rebi yosi, lo pasak la saori, nela rebi shmel, shaya samuch le edo. Okay, the only one who said that she gets, that she gets, um, uh, great um, uh, barley is Rabbi is uh, Rabbi Shmuel who was close to Edom. What that has to do with anything we'll see in the Gemara. Venozin lachati kav kitnis, and he gives her a half of a kav of kitnis um, of uh, legumes. We all know what kitnis are. The chazi lo shemen, and a half a log of of oil. This is per week. A, a log is when we you know say on Shabbos you need to have a revius. That's a revius of a log. So Revius is about three and a half ounces. So a half of a log is about whatever, seven ounces. Seven ounces of oil of oil. Um, the kav grow 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 uh, grow, grow groat and a kav of grow groat, which are d- uh, dried uh, uh, figs. Um, oh, mana de vela, or if she prefers, or maybe I don't prefers, it's in season, whatever. If she prefers dates to, dvig, to, to figs, then a, man, a mana, which is a weight measurement of, of, uh, pressed, of pressed dates. The ainlo, and let's say he doesn't have actually those fruits directly available, available. Then he gives her the equivalent amount from other types of fruits. 
Venosin la mita, so that's in terms of her food, the minimum amount he has to provide for food wise. Venosin la mita, mapatz umachatzelet, he gives her a bed, a mat, and a like, a, you know, uh, these are different types of a mat, some type of a cushion and a mat. Venosin la kipa le rosha, gives her some type of a covering for her head. The chagor le masneha, and a belt for her loins. Umin alayim, and so again, not question, not exactly question how frequently. The implicit part was the first part was on a weekly basis, although notice it never actually did say weekly. Um, presumably, you don't have to give her a new mita mapatz and machatzelet on a daily, on a weekly basis. So presumably that's if she doesn't have. So, and now that we're talking about more, what are these called, durables rather than consumables? Is that the phrase? Now that we're more sort of in the durable category, again, it's not clear exactly the frequency, but now when we get to the shoes and the clothing, we return, the frequency is more explicit. Um, and shoes, mimoed lemoed, new shoes every regio. The kalim shochamishim zuz, mishana lishana, and clothes, new clothes, of 50 zuz every year. Um, don't give her new clothes in the summer because new clothes were thicker. They hadn't been worn thin yet, so therefore they were warmer. So don't give her those clothes in the summer and don't give her the worn clothes, which are thinner in the winter, but that's when they're on sale. <laughs> Buy the new clothes of 50 zoos in the winter. Um, and then she can use them as they're worn out toward the uh, in the in the summer when you want worn out clothes. And then when you buy presumably the end of the year and you buy new clothes, she gets to keep the old worn out ones that have been used from last year. Plus, we had mentioned this before, she gets an extra of money um, for every, you know, every week, like pin money for whatever uh, small needs she might have. That's on a weekly basis. We're back to the implicit weekly basis. And even if he is, for whatever reason, they're living apart, um, he has to make a point of eating and having at least one meal together on every Friday night, which is quite interesting, right? Because you would sort of say, well, that makes a lot of sense. Like the rabbi, you know, you want to sort of have them to have some type of a continued personal relationship. Um, but it is interesting that we can sort of like dictate it. I mean, I guess why not? We can dictate that they have to have sex at regular intervals. We might as well dictate that they have to eat together at regular <laughs> intervals. But again, that is interesting. It's something that we're not, you you don't, you know, is it seems falls under like the rubric of like Parnassa, is not just paying the bills maybe, but a certain amount of actual spending some time together, you know, at the table. Okay, so, um, right, isn't that what people are trying to do? Encourage everybody to have at least one meal a week, like, you know, learn, you know, learn from the Jews, one type of a meal of the week, no TV, no whatever, everybody is just together at the table. We've been All doing right. that for thousands of years. Exactly, we sort of figured that one out. Okay, so that's the Friday night meal. I mean that at the end of the year you buy new clothes and she gets to keep the worn out ones. He doesn't say right. Okay. And if he doesn't give her the for the uh, pin money here, he keeps she keeps the masaya daim. If you remember before, there was a whole question whether that literally means she keeps the masaya daim or whether it means she keeps the most of masaya daim, which she earns over her uh, basic obligations. Umayi Osala, what is the work that she does in the house? Now, again, it's funny because we already listed all the work. She bakes, she sews, she knit, you know, whatever. I mean, it was this whole, she does the laundry, a huge list. So this here is the Masaya Daim, as I've mentioned before, which seems to also be um, A, a fixed amount, but also be probably something that she could earn, bring in some money, you know, into the house, into the house. She could actually, you know, uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> earn money from outside the house with. So um, so what does she do? So umahi osalo, mishko chamish slaim shesi bihuda, shein eser slaim begalil. So here is again different uh, weights. In Galil, the weights were half as much as in Yehuda. So something that weighs five, uh, uh, dealing with the uh, um, the warp, I forget if it's warp or wolf. Anyway, one of them, anyway, five seller worth of that weight in Yehuda, which is 10 seller worth in Galil, because in Galil, the weights were half as much. Okay, so she has to produce that and much of like weaving. Um, oh, Mishkal Eser Slaim Erev Yehuda Shein Esim Slaim Begalil, or 10, not of the warp, but of the wolf, or the other way around. Which way is it? Which one, Charlie, what does the mission say? What do you got there in your English? It, it, I keep on getting confused, which is which? The wolf is easier to prepare. Okay, so it's so so it's so it's ten, so it's five of the warp or ten of the wolf. So the wolf would okay, be five. Smaller one. five. Wait, what? 
the wolf, if it's easier to prepare, it's the bigger one. It's okay, the more. It doesn't one. matter. Nobody knows what it means anyway. Okay, moving on. Okay. Saint S and Sloy and Begalio. The warp is fixed in the loom. Okay, so fine. So the wolf would go back and forth. Fine. All right, fine. Vim um Vim Hai Saminika Pochin Lami Masi. Adel Masif and Lamas are no seha. So fine. That's anyway, that's the amount of sewing or whatever weaving that he has to do. And again, that's the amount that um that's like I said, that seems to be the one that's singled out here in terms of um in term because that's the thing that uh that you know she could actually earn money from. It's not just the inside the house domestic duties. So if you ask me, by the way, the shot of the Mishnah is not like either of the two opinions in the Gemara. If you remember before there are two opinions in the Gemara. Is the most is the Selah Sela Kesef Kinega the Masa Yadayim or Kinega the Moser Masa Yadayim? Right? It's only a little bit of money, so you would think that it's probably Kinega the Moser Masa Yadayim, not the Iker Masa Yadayim, and so on. I would say the Pshat in the Mishnah is it's Kinega the Masa Yadayim, but only the Masa Yadayim of the weaving and of the money that she's bringing in, not of the Masa Yadayim of the basic domestic, you know, sort of uh, duties. Uh, but that was never really fully spelled out in the Gemara, the difference between labeling the basic basic domestic responsibilities as Masi Yadayim, or labeling the earning that he's making by bringing money in from outside the house as the Masi Yadayim, which is what is being done here. Um, okay. Now, if she was nursing, she has to do less work because a, just because she's doing more work in one area that's less work in another, but also more importantly, because if she's doing all this work, it might not, uh, it might impact her ability to uh, nurse well. So it's not just like it's got to be fair and I'm doing more here, I do less somewhere else, but actually because it because it compromises her ability to nurse. And you actually give her an increase in her food allowance because uh, she has to eat for two. <laughs> when is this true? All of these minimums are somebody who is poor and had you know so we're talking about the minimum of a bimuchubad if somebody is at a you know is of a higher status then hakolik fik vodo it all goes according to his status or her status as we've seen okay money must nisin who's our mission low reb yochem and broker below rebbe shimon not reb yochem and broker not rebbe shimon that sort of gives this as a kav of chitin um, from the uh, for you know for her food. Um, now we turn in the Mishnah. The kama she uro. How much is the shear for the um, for the erev uh, tchumin, which has to be you know the the um, which is the which is the shear of two seudot. So what makes two meals worth? So mazun shtei seudot the kolachad echad. So the you know everybody has to everybody who's using the erev tchumim has to has to has to contribute you know two seudot per person who wants to make an erev tchumim. Echad Meir, and it's the amount of food you would eat on the weekday, not on Shabbat. That's what Meir says. This is specifically about bread. We'll see. Rabbi Yehuda Meir Shabbat below the No, it's the amount of bread you would eat on Shabbat, not on a weekday at a meal. Um, that's how you measure the two meals. And each one is trying to be lenient. What does that mean? That one says you eat more on Shabbos, so therefore you have the bread that you eat during the weekday. That's a smaller amount. And the other says, yeah, but on Shabbos you eat more. You eat more of different types of dishes, so you actually eat less bread. So the amount of bread that you actually eat is less on Shabbos than it is during the weekday. Okay. Um, so now the Gemara says, okay, but whatever it is, it's two meals. Now, how much does two meals of bread translate into? The amount that you determine of what is, um, you know, uh, what is two meals is the a loaf of bread that is purchased with a pundion, which is a small coin. When four of grain goes to a cellar, you know, it, it costs a cellar. So basically, let me sort of save you the math here, try to do it a little better than last time. A cellar is 48 pundion. Four se'in, a sa'a is six kav. So basically, he is saying, when you have 24 kav of uh, wheat, of wheat, going for 48 pundion, which is a coin, okay, then, then therefore, okay, which basically means, what does it mean? It means that one kav is two pundion, okay? Yes? So therefore he says, how much, there, and how much, um, how much is a bread worth two meals? So he says, kikar halakuach pundion. So if you can buy a kikar with a pundion, it is one loaf, made out of a half of a kav of wheat is two meals, okay? So a half of a kav of wheat is two meals. Take out the one here. A loaf of a half of a kav of wheat is two meals. That's what he says, okay? That's how, that's for him, 
two meals. A bread, a bread made out of a half of a cob of wheat is equal to two meals. So a half of a cob of wheat? Yeah, it would have been. Okay. Um, two thirds of a loaf of bread. When three loaves make up a cob. So for him, so the first one was who? Rabbi Yochanan ben Broca. Rabbi Yochanan ben Broca. Who's the next one? Rabbi Shimon. He says two thirds of a loaf. When what, when what does he say? When it's three loaves per kav. Loaves. So if it's three loaves per kav, it's a half of it's a third of a kav per loaf. So that means for him, right? That is so for two meals. Okay, all of this is two meals. I'll put the two meals here. Okay, for him it is a half of a here. The first one is a half of a kav, and this is two ninths of a kav. Big difference, right? Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. If it's one loaf and a half of a kav, it's a half of a kav. The two thirds of a loaf and a third of a kav per loaf. That's two ninths of a cob. Those are their different opinions about what makes two meals. Pretty big difference. Okay, less than half this opinion. These are small loaves. Okay, right. So um, <laughs> half of this is for how long it ha you have to wait. The amount of time it takes you to eat a half of a loaf is the amount of time it takes you to eat a meal. Now, half of a loaf is a what's the word for half in Aramaic? Pras. So when we say every day the phrase kedei achilat pras, that means eating half of a loaf of bread. Assuming the loaf of a bread is two meals, half of a loaf is one meal. So kedei achilat pras is the amount of time it takes you to eat a half a loaf of bread, meaning a meal's worth of bread. Okay. So whatever your two your loaf is, it's a loaf that's satisfying you for two meals. Half of that is going to be um, the amount that you have to wait in the house of a, that has Sarah to become Tameh. Because if you wait there the time it takes you to eat a meal, you become Tameh. But actually, as we know, as I've said, Kedei Achilles Pras is a much broader definition in many other areas. So half of the half, so if you eat a quarter of that loaf, half of a meal of Tameh foods, you become Tameh. Okay, I don't want to get into that. And half of the half of the half. So, okay, that is a an eighth of that loaf, or it's a, or it's a um, it's a quarter of a meal. That is the amount of food that can become tame um, as food stuff, which according to Rashi is a beitza. Okay. Anyway, we'll skip that part. Mani, we won't focus on it. So we said, how many kav did we say in the Mishnah of wheat? We said two kavim, right? Mishnei kavim chitin, or four kav of barley. So two kav of wheat. So let's figure out, according to him, a half, according to Rabbi Yochanan and Boka, half a kav is two meals. So two kav is how many meals? Two kav is, you, you, how much is, if a half of kav is two, two, two kav is four times this, is eight meals. Okay, according to Reb Shimon, two ninths of a kav is meal. So how much is, so out of every, out of every two kav, out of two ninths of a kav is two meals. So therefore, let's see how you figure this out. Two ninths of a kav, every one ninth of a kav is one meal. Okay. There's got to be an easier it's way to 18. do this. It's 18. Yeah. But there ha you know, there's an easier way to figure How do you do this? You divide, you divide two by okay. two. Okay, two kav is nine meal. No, yeah. two ninths of a kav is two meal, which means one ninth of a kav, okay, one ninth of a kav is one meal, is one meal, right, which means one kav is nine meals. So two kav is Okay, so two kav is 18 meals. Okay, so either, according to him, you know, two kav is going to be eight, and according to him, two kav is going to be 18. Big difference. Okay, big difference. But also, neither is the Mishnah because the, because if you need bread for a week, there's only 14 meals in a week, or 15 if you have Shalashudas on Shabbos. So that's the most problem. It assumes 14 meals a week, and it says either they're too few, too little bread according to him, or too much bread according to him. So how does it work? Let's take a look. Um, <laughs> okay. It's 18. Really, it's Rabbi Yochanan Mabroka that we said came to 8. Take out a third for the storekeeper. Okay? So what does that mean? It means Rabbi Yochanan Mabroka did not say that there's actually a half a cob of wheat in the loaf of bread. 
What he actually said was the loaf of bread cost a punyon and wheat is going at 24 kav to a punyon, which means what about the profit of the breaker? What about the profit of the storekeeper? He's not telling you how much wheat went in. He's telling you the price of wheat. So the says, well, if you factor in the profit of the baker, then actually when you're paying one punyon for a, for a loaf of bread, you're actually getting um, much, you're getting less than a cow, yeah. right? Because he's not using the, the, the entire money you gave him to buy the wheat the ingredients. What about his effort? So he's only using two thirds of the money you gave him to actually buy the wheat, the rest he's pocketing. So let's read this. So it says, um, so a third of the money you give him is going towards his profit. So he's not going to buy the wheat. So Hachanami, I see, I see Tiosa, take a third, Shadi Iluye, add it to it. Akati Tracer Hafyin, it's it's 12, meaning, so for him, it's it, it, that amount of wheat that, that you, that, that, that amount, two kav of, um, um, let me see if I can explain this in a way that's not confusing. This is backwards. I know, it's, it's very confusing. Um, two kav, you give her two kav, it doesn't make eight meals. You give her two kav, it makes 12 meals. If you were to buy that from the storekeeper, right, he'd sell you eight because he's profiting a third, a quarter, a, a third of it for his own profit. Okay, so when he says, uh, okay, we'll just work with that. Okay, I don't <laughs> I, I, if a pun, maybe the punion is the wholesale price. No, no, no. The punyon is what you pay the retailer. But the point is, he's telling you yeah, what the bread costs. You're converting it to how much flour you convert it to the wholesale price. Exactly, exactly. So when he says that this is the rate, this is only the rate at the retail price. Like that's maybe the easy way to think about it. This is the retail rate. This is what, and not only retail, this already went into loaf. But the actual amount of, of, of flour that you, the actual amount of flour that you get is actually a third more. And therefore, the amount of meals is whatever. I'm confused already. Anyway, fine. Okay, the point is that once you factor in the profit, really he's saying that that amount of wheat will produce 12 loaves of bread, not eight loaves of bread. 12, 12 meals, not eight meals. I understand, which is what which is what Rabbi Shimon said. And Rabbi Yochum and Broker gets you confusing because he's talking about the market price. Anyway, so Petitzer, according to him, it's not really eight. That amount of flour actually gets you twelve meals, not eight meals. Okay, so the Gemara says, okay, but twelve is twelve. It's not fourteen. So the Gemara says, no, ochel zimo lulel Shabbos. No, but you, you eat on Shabbos. Uh, the Gemara says, El Brigade, but that's only Friday night. That only gets you 13. So the Gemara says, That's anyway if Achila literally means that they eat together. Elamandamar Achila Tashmish, but some say Achila is a euphemism in the Mishnah. It means that they get together and have sex on Friday night. So, Michael and Amar, you still only have 12 meals. So, oh, even if you are eating together Friday night, Laser Avian, it's only 13 meals. El Amar of Chizda, fine. Same in Mechsel Chedbani. So it's not the f first version of Rav Chizda that the storekeeper is profiting a third. Actually, the storekeeper is getting is is profiting a half. That only half of the money goes towards the wheat. The other half he pockets. Okay, no, what? No, no, no. no, no is only when you charge more than the going rate. The Gemara will describe later why it might be a half and might might be a third. But the Gemara says, I don't know. When you go to a restaurant, how much do you think they actually pay for the raw ingredients? <laughs> Probably about ten, about two percent of actually what the bill is. Okay, so the Gemara says, Hakanami asya palga. So take half vishadi iluya. So and you add to it. So now instead of eight, you're going to get sixteen. Of course, sixteen is too much. So we'll take a look. Gemara says, first of all, kajid rav chizda rav chizda. First of all, what he's contradicting himself. Are we assuming the storekeeper is 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 getting a half profit or a third profit? So the Gemara says, no, lo kasha, hab asr di yavtsivi, hab asr di lo yavtsivi. It depends whether the storekeeper, when he buys the flour, does the pr provider of the flour throw in the, the uh, firewood for free or not? If the guy throws in the firewood, he makes a bigger profit. If the guy doesn't throw in the firewood, then he has to spend more expenses on the firewood. All right. Anyway, the kids are back to our point. So what we basically have said is with Yonam and Broca, it sounded like you're only going to get eight meals out of that amount of wheat. But then we realized, no, 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 no. That's the that's what you, you get when you buy it as as a produced bread because the guy's profiting. But really, that amount of wheat produces not eight meals, but it really produces double 16 meals. OK, so the woman is getting 16 meals of bread, but she only needs 14 meals of bread. So we still want to understand it. So the man says, Yachi shits are having it's 16 meals and we only need 14. Kiman Trebi Chitki. It's going like Reb Chitka. The Amar Arba Sudot Chayvadim Lecho Bashabis. You don't have to have three meals on Shabbos, you have to have four meals on Shabbos. Okay? So you go from your normal 14 to 16. 
And then the Gemara says, a few tamer rabbanon, and you know what? Even if it's the rabbis that say only three meals on Shabbos, so why is it sixteen and not fifteen? Chada l'archi uparchi. You have one extra measure of bread in case a guest drops by, so that's why it's sixteen, uh, you know, meals worth of bread. Now that we're mentioning this, even according to Rabbi Shimon, remember Rabbi Shimon said you would get 18 meals out of for Rabbi Shimon out of that amount of bread. So we, now we understand how why 18. Rabbanan for the rabbis who say three sudot on Shabbos. So you start with an idea of 15 meals during the week. Dal Tlas Archi he gets three extra loaves of bread for uh for, for guests who might drop by. Rabbi Chitkin, Rabbi Chitkin says that there are four meals on Shabbos, so you have 14 meals. So Dal Tarti Larchi Parchi, you have two extra lo- I'm 16 meals, excuse me. You have two extra loaves for guests that drop by. Okay, but kids are A possible yeah. guest. Yeah, that is interesting. But not her children. Not her children. Well, we're going to get to children, but that's a very good point. Yeah, that is interesting that uh, there is a little extra thrown in for the guests. Okay, anyway, one way or another, we figured out that it's the amount of bread that she needs to manage for a week, 14, you know, 14 meals plus job is 15, maybe get up to 16 or 18, but the amount of bread that goes with every single meal of the week. What I should mention, you know, what's absent from this Mishnah, what's absent from this Mishnah? She basically, for every meal, gets a loaf of bread, either of wheat or of barley, right? And then she gets, what else does she get? Some, some legumes, some oil, some dates or figs, okay? That's basically what she gets. What isn't she getting? Well, forget wine. She isn't getting any protein. She doesn't get any fish or meat oh, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> what? For the vegans in us, you'd be very happy with this, okay? No eggs, exactly. no milk. I'm serious, no cheese. I'm uh, serious. Totally, it's a very it's bare bone. I mean, this says Ani Shebi Yisrael, but this is very, very bare bones, right? It's basically, it's basically, you know, starch and a little bit of fruit. They're where are the vegetables also. How about vegetables, huh? Okay. Rabbi Dove, can you relate to that problem? Okay. There are no vegetables. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, what's the orchi parchi when they fly in? No, yeah, it means yeah. it means passersby. Yeah. Okay, moving on. I'm Rabbi Yossi, so now we had either that amount of wheat or twice that amount, okay, or or twice that amount of barley. And then Rabbi Yossi says, no, 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 the barley was only for Rabbi Ishmael who lives near Edom. So what does that mean? Sigmar so says, Elba Edom, who the Achlin Saorin, Bukliyama Lo Achli. What do you mean? Only in Edom they eat barley nowhere else? Um Lo Pazak Saorin Kifly in Bechitim. The reason the Mishnah said that if you give barley, it's double the amount of, of, of wheat. That's El Rabbi Shmael, Shaya Samachla Edom. That only Rabbi Shmael said that. Because their barley was very poor quality. So if you wanted to have the equivalent barley to wheat, it has to be double measure. But elsewhere, it would not have to be double measure, it'd be some other measure. Okay, so that's the basic bread that you're providing her for a daily basis, um, the, or a weekly basis. For no sin a half of cup of legumes, it's not bothered about me about the vegetables or about the uh, or about the protein. It's worried about the wine. This supports Rebbe Lezer. The Rebbe Lezer, the Rebbe Lezer says, "Ain't posting yenos leisha." You do not, when a woman is living separate from her husband and he is paying paying for the food, you do not give her out wine. Um, Poskin also is like a directive to Bastin. The husband maybe is away and hasn't made arrangements for his wife, and the Bastin has to determine what are, what are we going to do, take from his property, you know, in order to um, and to provide for her. So what we do not provide for her is wine. The Tomar, and if you say Elcha, and by the way, that would even be that's more categorical because the Mishnah remembers giving you the bare minimum. But if the Mishnah ended by saying that if he's of a higher social status, you would give her more. So let's say he is of a higher social status. Let's say you have a basin that's giving her steaks and uh, chicken and a, like a lot of stuff with whatever you're deciding she deserves in terms of her mizonot. Don't give her wine. We can't trust women with wine. Okay, v'im tomar elcha acharei ma'ahavai. Let me go to those who love me. Those nei lachmi u'meimai who give me my bread and my water. Tzimi u'fishti my uh, wool and linen. Shmani v'shikuyai my oil and my drink. So you see there that it indicates that women would drink wine. Not that necessarily pasuk is referring to a very um, you know a, a very uh, mod, um, uh, virtuous woman, but be that as it may. Devarim sheisha mishtokek asalei, and that doesn't mean wine. Shikuyai means things that a woman desires. That means jewelry, but you do not give her wine. 
Darish Rabbi Yehuda Ish Kfar Neviria, the Amile Ish Kfar Nafor, Chayo, Minayin Shein Poskin Yenon Slisha. How do you know that you do not sort of uh, give wine, you know, sort of uh, the basin does not allocate wine to the wom- to a woman? Again, and this is regardless of the uh, status or the wealth of the husband, but that we've decided that's a dangerous thing because uh, we, we're going to see in a minute, we assume that it will lead to licentious behavior. After she ate in Shiloh and after she drank. Shiso is read like the drinking, but not her drinking. So therefore, you see that she didn't drink. El Meata says Gemara Achlo Velo Achal. Should we read the uh, first one about Achlo with a hay to mean she ate but he didn't eat? Which uh, I'm not going to try to unpack all this. It's very confusing what the Gemara is getting at here. Hachanami? No. Anami Bishani Grabe Dibure Karmina. We're, we're saying because the puzzle changed what it should have said. Michti, Pikavaka Asi. It was talking about Chana. Vaasi. My time was Shani. Why did it say, what, you know, why did it say, Tuzzle basically said it should have said Achlo Vishtota and her drinking. Why did it say vishato? So my time uh, shani shmami na shato the drinking below shatate not her drinking. All right, so whatever that drasha is, meisve regila nosin la nosin la. We have a brayta that says if a woman is accustomed to drinking wine, we do allocate wine for her. Okay, regila shani. If she's accustomed, it's different. Then she can handle it. She's developed the tolerance. The amar bichin and avarkan amar shmuel regila nosin la kos echad. If a woman is accustomed, we do give her one one glass. I don't know what that means per day, per week, probably per day. Shame because they would if they were, you were accustomed to it, you would drink wine at every meal. Okay. Shaina regila, if she's not accustomed, no sin la Then you give her two ah. cuts. <laughs> so the guy says, Vai Kamar, what are you saying? So Amar Bai Hachi Kamar, here's what you're saying. Regila bifne bala shnekosos. If normally when she's with her husband, she drinks two cups of wine at each meal, then shalo bifne bala when she's apart from her husband, he's away on a business trip or whatever the case might be, and based in is allocating, then nosin la kos echad. Then you give her one cup. Ain't a regila beef nebala la kos echad. If she only has one cup when her husband's around, shalo beef nebala ain't nosin la kol ikar. You don't give her anything. Now, how to read that into the line of Shmuel, I don't understand. Tosus tries to read it in. But anyway, the point is, even if she is accustomed, you, you give her less than when her husband is around, because again, we're afraid that without her husband, maybe A, she's not, her husband is around, so she's not having her sexual desires met, and she, you know, her husband isn't there to sort of rein her in, and all these other assumptions that the Gemara is making, and therefore we have to be more careful. So even if she's accustomed, you give her less, and if she's accustomed to only one, you give her nothing. They so the Gemara said, what? They need to go to Alan. Okay, the Ebais Ema. Okay, and if you want, I can say Regila, even if she's accustomed, you don't give her wine for her to drink without her husband. But no sin la kadeira, you give her for to add to the to, to the stew, right? Because sometimes you use wine as a cooking ingredient. So, but you wouldn't <laughs> give her any wine to drink without her husband being around. The story with the daughter-in-law of Nakdimon ben Gurion. The rabbis allocated for her two se'a of wine for the uh, for for her for for, for cooking. So me'er shabbos le'er shabbos from on a weekly basis. Amalan, she said to them, no say chem. So, you know, it, it, she was, it sounds like, you know, you never know if this is ironic or not, but it sounds like she was happy. And she said, oh, thank you so much. That was so generous. You should also merit that your daughters also should be in similar situations, I guess. I, it's assuming it was, it was serious and not ironic. Okay, and she get that amount of wine. Tana, Shamers Yabam Haita, she actually was awaiting Yibum, the low Anu Achareha Amen. And they didn't say Amen because then it would have been like a bad Siman. It would have meant that their daughter in laws would have been, you know, or their daughters yeah, would be, would be, their husbands would die on them. But now, by the way, we're also implicitly seeing why the rabbis are allocating, as opposed to the husband being alive but being away on a trip or just them living apart for whatever reason, he could also be dead. And remember, one of the Tznaik Suva is that the woman is provided for from the dead husband's estate. Mm-hmm. So how would you determine how much food she gets from the dead husband's estate? You would presumably use a similar type of guidelines as our Mishnah. So this Mishnah could be very important for the ongoing support of the Amana. So a woman awaiting Yibum is also the Amana of the dead husband. So they are determining what is her ongoing support from the estate. When, they, when the Gemara says like, 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 in other words, what does that look like? The, the servant 
who is in charge no. of the estate. No, she comes to Basin, and she and the and the ears come to Basin, and she the ba and she basically says, uh, I, "I I need my food provided for me." So the Basin figures out what food she's entitled to and determines how much they have to provide her for on a weekly basis, whether they write out a check or whether they actually provide her with right. the food there's no, itself. There's nobody, in other words, what it means is they give her the amount of money that would enable her to have that. Well, the Mishnah money. makes it sound like they actually give it, because exactly. the Mishnah says I mean. if he doesn't have this fruit, he gives her fruit from another, he gives her other fruit. So it sounds like he literally is giving her this actual, look, if it, it, it'd be, I'd be more convenient for me if somebody wants to make a delivery of groceries to my door than just gives me a check and I have to go out and shop. So if this is really the amount that she would use, it'd be much better for her to actually get the food itself directly delivered, right? But um, if we basically wind up that he gives her a check and then she deter decides, I'm not going to have my press dates today. I'm going to use some of that money to buy wine. Nobody's going to stop her. But if we're actually providing, if we're figuring out how big that check should be, or we're actually providing her the food She's itself. You're delivering a certain amount of wine. Exactly. So we're not delivering, the, well, the point is we're not delivering the wine unless it's for the cooking purposes. Okay. So now we get to what's underlying all of this hesitancy. Tana, kos echad yafel isha. One glass of wine, that's good for a woman. Shnayim, and as we've seen before, maybe even that only if her husband's around. Shnayim nivelhu. Two, it's like, it's uh, unseemly. Thank you, it's a good translation. Shlosha tovat repair. Once she has three glasses of wine, she'll basically verbally demand sex from some whoever, whatever, whatever, not just vulgar, she'll actually proposition men for sex. Arba'a for a few chamor tovat b'shuk. Even if she sees a donkey in the marketplace, she'll try to have sex with it. The Aina Makpedis, and she doesn't care. So anyway, this is obviously another Gemara being written by men. Um, also in the society where women had less wine, so actually probably they probably did have less of a tolerance for it, but still it's pretty extreme what it uh, sort of assumes. Amarava. All of this, as we've been implying before, is if the husband isn't around. Nobody is going to tell her if she's with her husband. This is the husband isn't there, and it's Basin's responsibility to determine whether to give her wine or not. How much for her? How much you know food to provide for her? If she's with her husband, nobody is going to tell her, you know, or, you know, her or her husband that they can't decide to have wine together. Okay. A, we assume that the husband will more protect her. You know, will more stop. You know, pr you know, protect against not her, protect against certain behavior. But also, I would say more significantly, it's none of our business, right? Um, are you so? So therefore, you know, it's only our business if her husband isn't around, and we're the ones providing the food. The ha, the Gemara says, "Achana de bali imahave." One minute, Chala was there. With, Chana was there with her husband when they when you you know in Shiloh, and it says, and we made the whole drasha that she didn't drink wine. So you said it's okay to drink wine with a, if a woman's with her husband. So the Gemara says, no, Achsenai Shani. There they were guests. They weren't at home. How do you know if you guest at somebody's house and they give you a bedroom that, that, that you know husband and wife shouldn't be having sex? Um, they rose up in the morning and they bowed down to God. They came back to their home in Ramah. Only then they had sex. Only now, not before. So you have to be much more careful about your behavior, even if it's okay in a in your privacy of your own home. But when you're guests in somebody else's home, you have to be more careful, whether it's about having sex and whether it's about drinking wine and so on, getting carried away, etc. Okay, now we're going to have some stories. Choma de Vasayu Dabaye, Choma who was Abaye's wife, who apparently was very beautiful. Asay Lakami de Rava, she came to Rava. And her apparently Abaye was away on some uh, teaching trip. So Amrale, she said to him, Pasak li Mizoni, did you know determine for me, you know, uh, 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 allocate for me the food that I'm that I can be provided for. So Pasakla, so he figured it out. He wrote out the amount and you know, he had a he 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 gave her whatever he, from based in that would entitle her to collect that amount of food from the estate. Okay, so Pasakla, so Pasakli Kham. So now, uh, hey, wait, there's no wine on this list. Allocate for me wine. Amrle, he said, Yadana be bin Nachmeni, I know Nachmeni, which is the by his name. Um, he wouldn't drink wine. Amrle, so she said back to him, by, the, by, by your life, 
The Havi Maskili Bishufrizi, he would actually drink for Maskili, he would drink wine Bishufrizi in like a horn or like a elongated cup. Ki hai, this big, this big of a cup. She like held out her hands, he would drink wine. Which, by the way, echoes the previous point of the Gemara that people do things in private that they don't do, do in public. Because I buy, I know he never drank wine. She says, A lot, you know, I'll tell you he drank wine. Okay. So anyway, Ki hai, to come Machvile. As she was demonstrating to him, like this big of a cup and holding out her arms, her, 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 her arm became exposed, like the sleeve uh, fell down her arm. And light shone in the base medrash. Her, her, her arm was, her skin was so beautiful. It was like a glowing occurred in the base medrash. So come Rava. So Rava got up. He was very disturbed. Um, as we'll see, he was very sexually excited. Al say he went home. Tava lebas Rav Chizda, and he uh, he uh, propositioned his wife, who was the daughter of Rav Chizda, and uh, basically had sex with her in the middle of the day. So um, so Amrale, so Bas Rav Chizda, so his wife said to him, "Man havaha in the bevedina. Uh, what happened today in court, honey?" <laughs> Amrale, he said to her, "Chomad vasayu da baye." So uh, well, Choma by his wife came to court. So Navika Basra, so Rava's wife ran after her. Machsala Bikufi Dashid and and sort of hit her with the strap from the uh, from a chest. Um Ad Afkala Mikula Mukhuza until she chased her from the whole city of Mukhuza. Because she saw this woman was just gonna lead men or her husband astray. Amrle, she's Amrla, she said to him, Katlus Lichtwasa, you've already killed three men. She apparently she had been married three times, and every single time her husband had died. Okay, not exactly clear to me. Maybe this third time was Abaye who had died, and that's why she was coming to the court to get the food, because maybe Abaye had died, although it doesn't it's not clear. It doesn't say that. I'm trying to figure out why she's in the court to get the food. And now we're finding out that her um that her husband had died yeah, three times. Right. Okay. And now uh, that she had three husbands, not her husband died three times. She had three husbands. She had so, three husbands, each of whom had died. Each of whom had died. Okay, so you've already killed three. The Asa Lamikta Lachrina, and now you want to kill a fourth? Like, you know, your beauty is going to lead yet another man astray, and now he's going to die. And my husband, probably, and he's going to die. Which makes sense, therefore, given that, that it could be that Abaya has had. Is, was dead, which is why they were coming to the court to get the Mazona, but maybe not. Okay, moving on. Um, what does our name mean? I don't know. Moving on. Okay. The Vasayu de Rav Yosef, Braid Rava, the wife of Rav Yosef, the son of Rava, I'll say the coming to Rav Nechemia, Braid Rav Yosef, came by Rav Nechemia, the son of Rav Yosef. Not clear if it's the same or a different Rav Yosef. Amalek, he said, Psokli Mizoni, allocate for me Mizonot. Again, my husband is either dead or away, whatever it is. Pasakla, he wrote it, you know, he allocated. Pasakli Chama, how about wine? Pasakla, he wrote it out for her. Amrla, Amrla. So he said to her, I know the people of Mechuza, which is again, which that they drink wine. So for you coming from that town, drinking wine is like a regular, like if you go to France, right? You know, you know, I don't know. I never grew up, but you know, for me, what we had at what, the, the, the drink we had at that dinner was either water or if you were an adult, you got to drink soda. You know, you go to other places, it's like they, they drink wine at every single meal. You know, you go to France, they drink wine at every single meal. So anyway, so where you are, determine on whether this is considered something dangerous or something normal to be allocating the wine. Okay. The Vasayid Rav Yosef, Braid Rav Menasha, Mi Davio, so this is the wife of Rav Yosef, the son of, uh, the, the son of Rav Menasha from Davio, Asi the coming to Rav Yosef, came in front of the Rav Yosef, not, 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 her, not her, her husband. I'm going to say, Mizone, allocate for me Mizono, Pasakla, Pasakli Chana, how about wine, Pasakla. Pasikli Shirai. So how how about uh, silk clothing? So nice garments. Amrla, Shirai Lama. Why do you need nice clothes? You know, I mean, your husband's dead, I guess, or whatever way. Why do you need such nice, fancy clothes? Amrla, she said to him, Lach v'lechavacha l'chavotecha. For you and for your friends and your friends' friends, meaning, presumably, her, the husband is dead, but uh, you want, you know, you're, you're my dead husband's colleagues, and you don't want his widow to go around looking, you know, uh, unseemly. So I should, I need to wear clothes for uh, for his respect, which is an interesting question, right? Gets to the whole issue about the, um, I mean, you know, again, in our mission, we had the obligation to provide clothes. And again, well, that's whether the husband is away or whether he's dead and it's from the estate, but how fancy clothes and how much is that about her kavod is about the dead husband's kavod and so on. You know, how exactly to translate this into a rule is an interesting question. Do you think that the wives of Abai and Rav knew each other? Uh, yeah, yeah, but right? I don't know. You it's know? a good question. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Now you give also the cushion and the uh, mat. 
a bed, a cushion, a mat. Why do you need a mat and a cushion? They assume that you had a bed that was made out of some type of a stretched leather, and therefore you just lie straight on it. Who needs the mat? So, um, again, I don't know enough about rabbinic beds or whatever to, to comment about this next time we're, we're going to be learning. It's a place where the, where the beds, the bed, you know, is not made out of stretched leather, but it's made out of ropes, crisscrossed ropes. Ropes. The mavagir law that that you know irritates her and rubs against her, so you need a mat to put on top of it. Okay, so I, like we have a bed frame or something like that. Okay, tenor abanan ain't nosin la karvikese. You don't give her like a pillow and a blanket. Mishum reb nosin omer nosin la karvikese. You give her a pillow and blanket. Hey chidami, what's the case? Eid orcha. If normally she's accustomed, then again, like she comes from a family that's accustomed to it. My time at the dalan kama. Why not? Be the lav orcha if she's not accustomed. My time at the rebbe nosin. The rebbe nosin. Why would rebbe nosin say that you do give it? He normally has it, and she normally does not. Um, and the assumption here being, you know, normally you say that she, your mala imo veinu yoredes imo, so you would assume that she'd be entitled to it all the time because that's what he because he's entitled to it. But the gemara seems is going to seem to assume that she's only entitled to it when she is with him. So therefore, here's the concern. Tanakama Savar, Amarla, he'll say to her, Look, Kiazilna, when I'm going on my business trip, Shakilna Luhu, I'll take my pillow and blanket with me. And presumably you're not entitled to a pillow and blanket when we're not together. You go back to what your normal custom is. The Kiasina, and when I come back from my business trip, my Sina Lu, I'll bring my pillow and blanket back with me. So I don't have to give it to you when I'm not around. But Hadai, I'll bring it back with me. But if Nazan Savar, no, Amrle, she can say to him, Zimni de Misrami Benish Mashas, sometimes it'll be Benish Mashas, which presumably also means, as we said before, Bain Shimshay, which means Friday night. You'll be coming back, it'll be late Friday, you won't be able to carry, so you won't be bringing your pillow and blanket back, and you'll be showing up Friday night. The Lomati Smaisi Lu, you won't be able to, brag, to, to bring it. The Shaklis Luhuli Didi, and you'll take mine. Umagni Si Alaran, you'll make me sleep on the floor. Now, the problem is, you'll take mine is, what do you mean you'll take mine? I thought she doesn't she didn't have it, because he took the pillow and blanket. So some people don't have the gear, so you you'll take mine. Some people basically have the gear, so which is, you'll, you'll come home without your pillow and blanket, you'll want to use my mat, you know, for your pillow and blanket, because you won't have your pillow and blanket, and you'll make me sleep on the floor. Or some other scenario, which is, you'll come home, and once you're home, I'm entitled to a pillow and blanket, and you won't have it, because you won't have brought it with you. So basically, you got to give me a pillow and blanket even when you're not around. Okay, if you know in La Kipa, you give her some covering for the head. I'm aware of Papa Labai, so Papa said to Abai, um, Hi, Tana, Shaliach Artiloi, this this Tana basically, um, you know, is uh, stripped naked, Virami Misani, and has her wearing shoes. Meaning she puts she gets new shoes every regal three times a year, but she only gets new clothes once a year. So what's the story? Like she has new shoes more frequently than she gets new clothes, so she should be basically you know in tatters but with new shoes. Amrlei Tana b'mokam harin kai. No, our Tana is living in a place where there's mountains. The low sagya below plus the zuge misani. That it's not that you need three three pairs of shoes a year. Yes, the shoes wear out quicker than the clothes. And in passing, he's telling you, as long as he got to buy new shoes three times a year, might as well buy it at the Regalim. Of course, the spacing between Pesach and Shuas is not exactly a, a, a normal spacing, but okay. Um, an equal spacing. What? Hiking season. There you go. The Kayum Shah Hamishim Zuz, new clothes of fifty zoos once a year in the winter. The Medram of Amarbay, Hamishim Zuz Pshiti. These are these lower zoos, they're different measures of zoos. But anyway, this is the zoos of the Ksuva. So basically, it'd be a quarter of the Ksuva value. Um, okay. Mimai, um, how do you know? But the Midikani, because it says, the Medvar Mamurin Ba'anishab Yisrael. Because we're talking about the bare minimum for the poor. If it's Zuz, which is the more expensive version of the Zuz, there's two different versions of the Zuz, with one is much greater than the other. Where would a poor person have that? Even on a, for a yearly expense. Fine. Now you have to give it to her the right time. If basically the woman does not eat all the food that's provided, there's leftover food, he can reclaim it. Most of Blaot, however, if the clothing wears out, he can't reclaim it and sell it in a yard sale. Isha, she's entitled to the leftover clothing at the end of the year. Most of Blaot, the Isha Lamala. So the Mar says, I don't get it. If you're buying her new clothes every year, why does she need last year's worn out clothes? Oh, no, she wants you, you want some not nice clothes. She'll wear it when she's in Nida. 
So she should not be found not pleasing for in her husband's eyes because when she's Anita, she's menstruating. The blood gets on the clothes. They didn't have, you know, tight-fitting underwear or whatever. So therefore, she'll wear those in the time that she's Anita so, she, so, so that the clothes that she wears when she's not Anita will not have stains on it. Amar Bayi Naktinan, we rule, most of Laos Amana, well, let's say it's a widow being provided from the dead husband's estate. We've been saying that that's the parallel of the husband being not around. So if they're, if, 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 if once those clothes wear out and they buy her new clothes, Liyarshav, then the heirs get to reclaim the old clothes. Hasam who Deloti Skani Bapa, why does she get the old clothes when she's married to the husband? because she shouldn't uh, be found disfavorable, like, you know, in his eyes that she's wearing these stained clothes. So, ha, ha, he's kind of, he's kind of, here we're dealing with the heirs. Let them, you know, let them not like the way she looks or whatever. Um, so, therefore, it's only a special accommodation because she's married to the husband that we want, we allow her to keep the old clothes. No sin Now, this extra little weekly allowance. My ocheles, and she eats with him on every on every Friday night. What does ocheles mean? Rav Nachman amor ocheles mamish. Literally, they eat together Friday night. Rav Ashi amor tashmish. No, it means they have sex Friday night, even if they're living apart. Sort of going back to the own idea, but Tosos makes an important point. It's not just the own idea. Look at this Tosos, Rav Ashi amor tashmish. He says, afilu gamal v'safan, even the camel driver and the ship, whatever, that's once every, you know, six months, they still have to eat, they have sex with her together weekly if it's this scenario. If you're living together and you're away on business, so we could say once every six months have sex. But if you're living apart for whatever reason, then you got to be having sex on a weekly basis. So it's interesting, like Hazal being marriage counselors, you know, <laughs> there's like, oh, something's a little bit problem here. We got to insist on more frequent sex since they're living apart. Okay, so that's a very interesting point that Tosis makes. Yeah, I know, but assuming that it's an off season or something, he's not getting business. Okay, I know he has to be around, but assuming he's around, he has to be have more frequent sex with his wife if they're living apart than if they're living together. What would even give them the thought to ask the question, my uh, I don't it's know. A... Well, yeah, but I don't know. Okay. But okay, okay, yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Okay, let's take a look. Let's just get to the bottom. If somebody has to leave, leave. But we're getting to we're ending this parrot. <laughs> If it's sex, why does it use the phrase eat? It's a euphemism. She eats and wipes her mouth. And I did nothing wrong. Okay, we are. This is a euphemism that's pretty common. says you eat together on Friday night, this Shabbat, and Shabbos itself, Shabbos day. If it literally means eating, we can understand eating together Shabbos day. But if it's sex, who's having sex during the day? Doesn't Ravuna say we're not supposed to have sex during the day? No, Rav says, if the house is dark, it's okay. So we could be talking about having sex during the day. Okay, last line, if she was nursing, she does less work and you give her more food. So, although they said a, a person, a man, has no obligation to feed his children and minors, um, but when they're very small, he has to provide for them. <laughs> until what age? Until six. Until he's six years old, he he goes, you know, he follows his mother's Erev if she makes an Erev Tchumen, because he's assumed to be dependent on her and to eat together with her. And since an Erev is based on where she's, her food is and where she's eating, he follows her up till the age of six. So, so basically, it implies that his obligation to provide food for her includes food for her kids, because her kids are seen as dependent on her. And that's until six. Now, Mimai, where do you get this idea from that he has to provide for the kids? If he's nursing, you give her more food. My timer, why are you giving her more food? Because he has to produce milk for the kid. So therefore, you know, means that, that you are paying a higher food bill so your kid can eat. So you are responsible for your food, for your kid being able to eat. 
So while he's still nursing from the mother, and the mother then extends it to nursing to dependent on the mother till the age of six. And it says, No, maybe it's not that the kid could eat. Maybe it's because as she's nursing, she for herself has greater food needs because she's like, you know, she's considered like a little, she's like a chola. Now, in Cain, listen, in Haisa chola. So say if she's sick, give her more food. Why say if she's nursing? Maybe it's telling you that no, a nursing woman is considered like she's sick because, you know, the baby, the nursing drains her, but still the food is for her. It's not because of an obligation to feed the kids. So Gemara says, Itmar, I'm Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. So the Gemara doesn't have an answer to that. But then the end by saying, back to the wine, you give her wine because wine helps with the milk. So interestingly, I should say, the Gemara doesn't answer how we know that it really is for the kid, not for her. Not only that, but let me give you a scenario. Let's say a man's wife dies. Does he have a legal obligation to feed his kids if his wife is dead? Even according to the Gemara's position that he has to feed his kids, it sounds like it's because it's part of feeding one's wife. And the mother, you know, and the mother, so the kid is dependent on the mother. You feed the mother, so you're feeding also the kids as sort of part of the package. If the, if the mother dies, right, does a man have any obligation directly to provide for his kids when they're small? It doesn't sound like it. All right, so we will end with the whole list of the way he has obligations for his wife's food, but very questionable the degree he has obligations for his kids' food.